The following is a presentation of the new skin, BYU Sports Network. The Big 12 era has begun, and BYU Cougars football is on the air. Martin finds space to the right. Martin's got a first down and more! The 10, the 5, the touchdown! Shaking off tacklers and taking it in for 6. We are two hours away from kickoff, and it's time to get you ready for the matchup with Cougar Pregame Live. Cougar Pregame Live is brought to you by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Cougar Pregame Live is also brought to you by Tucano's Brazilian Grill. Phenomenal flavors, a festive setting, and more fun than you can shake a skewer at. Also by Siegfried and Jensen, helping Utah families for over 30 years. Now, to get you ready for today's game, alongside Hans Olsen, here's your host, Ben Bagley. And good morning, BYU fans, at least for another half hour. Welcome into Mount the Mountain America Credit Union pregame live show. Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Today, the BYU Cougars head to Stillwater, Oklahoma, with the goal to spoil the 23rd-ranked Cowboys Big 12 championship game hopes and also achieve ball eligibility on their own with their sixth win. I am Ben Bagley. Thank you for joining us for BYU football. Joining me is former Cougar and Utah Blaze great and a man who struck out <laughs> drilling for oil in the plains of Oklahoma, but in doing so found his true calling in life as a radio talking head, Hans Olsen. Hans, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Really doing great, man. We are up here in the booth. It is an overcast, drizzly day. You've got some low temperatures. It's going to be a little bit chilly, but Greg Rubel, the homing pigeon that he is, he's been fantastic all year long. He gets us where we need to be. He's very aggressive with it, and we always find our booth, <laughs> and it's just awesome, man. <laughs> i, I got to tell you, Ben, and, and I feel a little bit selfish taking a minute here, but this has been such an incredible pleasure, just hanging out with Greg, hanging out with Mitch, and then rotating with Jake and and Matt Jarvis, and just having a blast with the crew on the road. And this one's a fun one, Ben. It's This one's a really fun one. This stadium has 60,000 seats. It is obviously renowned. The Boone Pickin Stadium is renowned. It is a 60,000-seat stadium that has been sold out all seven home games. This BYU home game sold out months ago. I know that this thing's going to be packed, and the road has just been a blast, Ben. So... We're excited. We're excited to get this one kicked off. One, one interesting, unique thing about Boone Pickens Stadium there, Hanson, you get a good view of this from the press box, is how tight the quarters are down on the sidelines with the, the, the fans pretty much right on top of you on the sidelines and even back down in one of the corners of the end zone. Very little room before be between the end line of the end zone and a brick wall. It's interesting. I, it's as close as you as I've seen it to the back end corners of the end zone. So the way the stadium is shaped, just so people can kind of visualize this, if you took a football and you put it down on the ground and then you built stands around the football, it's kind of that same shape. (laughs) And you've got the corners of the end zone that are maybe 8 feet, 10 feet away from the back corner of that end zone so fans are really close there and then you're probably what 15 maybe 20 feet from that first row of fans to where the football players stand it is it's a it's a different positioning for where the fans sit next to the the players i can tell this is going to be a pretty crazy environment for them and there's going to be a lot of emotion we'll get into that in a second but before we talk some football hands i want to just uh give a huge rise and shout out to two other byu uh athletics teams that did great things yesterday first BYU soccer scoring four unanswered goals in the final 30 minutes to overcome a 3-0 deficit to North Carolina Bella Foligno netting two goals in the second half comeback along with goals by Brecken Mazingo and Olivia Wade Katoa as the Cougars advance to the College Cup to face Stanford in a semifinal match on Friday so the women heading to the soccer final four again with Jen Rockwood and then last night, the men's hoop team also coming from behind to be NC State 95-86 to win the Vegas showdown in Las Vegas. BYU was led in scoring in that game by Jackson Robinson, who recorded a career high of 23 points in the win. So, so hey, there's some good karma right now in BYU Athletics coming off of two great second-half comebacks by the women's soccer team and the men's basketball team. Now looking to see what football can do today. Hans, this game, huge for both teams. Like, I, I get it. It's the last regular season game of the season, and that's part of it. 
But there's a lot on the line in this game. Well, let's the, set it up. The, yeah, yeah you set, got the Cowboys. Yeah, let's set it you up. You got the Oklahoma this State is, Cowboys. Is really They're going this. into this game. They have to win this game to get the Big 12 championship. Based off of what happened yesterday with Texas and Oklahoma both winning, it's win to get in to the title game for the Oklahoma State Cowboys. And BYU, on the other hand, it's win or go home. Literally, win or go home. Either you're coming home and the season's over with a loss, or you win and you become bowl eligible and fight to, for one more game this season. A lot on the line there, Hans. Well, you hope that BYU shows up like it means something to them. Because if they show up like they showed up against Oklahoma, this is going to be a really good game. But I do believe Oklahoma State is going to show up fully committed, knowing now that Texas got the win yesterday. That seals their shot in the Big 12 championship game if they get the win against BYU. There are some possibilities that if Oklahoma State doesn't win, they still can navigate into the Big 12 championship game. But why not just seal it? You know they're in that locker room talking about it. And you know Coach Gundy's a very convincing individual. Man, he's been around a lot of years. You know what's incredible, Ben? You think about this. Now, Coach Gundy has been here a lot of years, and he has taken this team to five New Year's Bowls since 2009. You know, we talk about going to a New Year's Bowl game and how difficult it is, and some programs will champion just going to one New Year's Bowl game. He's been to five since 2009, so he knows how to motivate these guys he knows how to get them locked in, and he knows what's on the line. A return trip to the Big 12 championship game. That's huge for him. That's absolutely massive for Coach Gundy. So he's got them laser focused. And then on the flip side, as you mentioned, BYU is a win or go home scenario. And I can tell you right now, they need every extra practice that they can possibly get. Everything that they can possibly get where they're working, these young guys, because they're going to be losing a lot on their offensive front. They're going to be losing a lot defensively, and they're going to have to replace a few guys. So they need as much time as they can get through bowl preparation to get guys on the field and see what they've got in their personnel. This is big for BYU. It's really big, and it's big for me. I want to extend this, man. I want to do another road game with Greg and Mitch and, and the crew. I want to get out there and experience a BYU bowl game as part of the radio, the BYU radio broadcast. So it's big for me that uh, that these guys go out there and play their hearts out, play like it means something, play focused, play well coached. I think it's really important today, Ben. I want to see them come out and play like they did last week, and we're going to get to that in a second. But one thing that's going to be interesting, and, I, and I, I'm just looking into my crystal ball a little bit, you were right, you're right in what you said about how much this game means for Oklahoma State. And it being in their home stadium and that stadium being the way it is where it is loud and it is raucous, I fully expect that Oklahoma State comes out and comes out fast. The question is, is can BYU withstand that first flurry, that first bit of emotion, that first bit of excitement of the game from the home crowd and the home team and hang on in there and then counterpunch their way right back into it like they did against Oklahoma where Oklahoma scores, BYU scored right back, so forth and so on. Well, yeah, let's take a look at this because the last two games for Oklahoma State have been uniquely different, very different. So you go back to that Central Florida game a couple of weeks ago, and Central Florida, they take the ball on the first possession and offensively, using all RPO, the run-pass option, the entire drive. They go down the length of the field, and they score on Oklahoma State with their first offensive possession, and they do it with authority and great movement. I will tell BYU fans, Oklahoma State's defense, they give up some lanes. They give up some rushing yards. They give up passing yards. Their total defense, you know, they're one of the basement dwellers in the country. They're 118th in the country. They're giving up 432 yards, so you can move it. And Central Florida did just that. They took possession, went the length of the field, and they scored. And then what was great for Central Florida, on Oklahoma State's first offensive possession, they hit Ollie Gordon, and he fumbles the football. He gives it back to Central Florida, and they instantly take that about 50 yards, and they score. They go up 14 to nothing. And the, the following offensive possession by Oklahoma State, you have Alan Bowman, who throws an interception. 
and they take that the length, and they kick a field goal. They go up 17 nothing. So there were three turnovers in the first half of that game against Central Florida, and Central Florida established their dominance with the opening offensive possession. So this goes to what you just said, Ben. BYU has to come out, and they've got to pull a Central Florida-like look. By the way, defensively, Central Florida was playing with no fewer than seven in the box in any given time against Oklahoma State in anything that was a potential rundown. So anything that's a potential rundown. They had at least seven in the box, and they were still spilling it. They were still rolling safeties in, and they're still filing in to make sure that they're stopping Ollie Gordon. I love their game plan. Okay, now, fast forward. You leave Central Florida, and then you're like, who is this Oklahoma State team? He just got whooped by Central Florida. Fast forward to Houston. Alan Bowman, the quarterback, threw a pick six against Houston. Outside of that, Oklahoma State was just dominant. Stomped Houston. Stomped them in every area. Ollie Gordon became Ollie Gordon again. But this is what's interesting. And I'm going to watch for this, Ben. And I think all BYU fans should watch for this as this game gets started. The way Mike Gundy used Ollie Gordon as a flare because he saw what Central Florida did. They, they shoved the box, and they kept everything inside. So he goes to Houston, and he's like, yeah, Houston's going to shove the box. They're going to keep everything inside. So he goes to Houston, and all he did for the first three offensive possessions was use Ollie Gordon as a flare. Ran play action off of that flare and put everything in the intermediate route and just went up and down the field until Houston made the adjustments. And then Houston made defensive adjustments. They spread it out to stop the intermediate game. And then they hand it off to Ollie Gordon, and Ollie goes for whatever it was, 170 yards against Houston. So understand the game plan. Know what the last two games look like. And BYU's defense should be prepared for what they what – they, as far as the lineups and what Mike Gundy is going to attempt to do, they should be prepared to know what's coming. Yeah, and a great point because as, as, as Ollie Gordon goes, so does this Oklahoma State offense. If you look at it on the season, 1,400 yards, 1,314 for Ollie Gordon, averaging 6.7 yards a carry, which is a massive amount. But at last week at Houston, 6'6", six, six, just, one, just point one below his average. Against UCF, 2.1 yards per carry, yeah. only 25 yards in the game. But before yep. that, 4'2", 10, 8, 9, 7. I mean, th- if he's – giving you chunk yardage, six-plus yards a, a carry going into a game, it's going to be tough to beat Oklahoma State. So BYU's got to be aware of that, and they've got to stop Ollie Gordon. Well, let's tell everybody a little bit more about Ollie Gordon because Ollie Gordon right now is the favor for the Doak Walker Award. His name is now included as one of the top three in the Heisman race because of what he's doing with his feet and rushing. So think about this. Ollie Gordon had 282 yards rushing in that win over West Virginia to rank as the most for any FBS player in a game this season. He followed that game up with 271 yards rushing against Cincinnati. Only Barry Sanders, there's only two in play in school history that have back-to-back 250-yard-plus games, and that's Barry Sanders and now Ollie Gordon. So that kind of tells you what type of rarefied air he is in and his capabilities. At any given moment, Ollie Gordon can break it, He'll break arm tackles. He'll break through. He'll break through two tackles. He'll split the doubles, and he'll get going. So, you're never going to see a running back and a game that is more critical of good solid tackling. And one last thing. We'll talk more about Ali Gordon coming up in just a second as we talk to Dave Hunsaker, the uh, voice of, of Oklahoma State. But I want to talk about the other big story for BYU, like last week going into the game. Is it, are we going to see uh, Keaton Slovis or Jake Retzliff in this game? Hans, it, it's it's that same kind of argument you and I talked about last week in Cougar Canyon. Is Slovis if healthy he gives you the, he gives you that kind of uh, he's not going to he's not going to kill you with turnovers, which Retzliff did last week. But Retzliff also made the offense more dynamic, and he got a chance to look at what the future might hold if he's your guy going forward for BYU. And now Kalani and A Rod have that same debate going into today's game. Well, I think the most important thing that people need to understand is that Brian Nardo, he's a first-year defensive coordinator with Oklahoma State. This guy came from the FCS ranks, and he's a first-year guy now with Mike Gundy. Mike was a big believer in this guy. He's a young dude. Right now, Brian Nardo 
needs to make sure he's got two defensive game plans in because it's two completely different looks from a quarterback, whether it's Keenan Slovis or Jake Retzlaff. So what Aaron Roderick and Kalani Sataki really, really needed to focus on coming into this is keeping it a mystery for Oklahoma State so that they had to work on two defensive game plans because if you can zero in on one guy or the other and you can kind of eliminate it and say, oh, no, it's it's going this way, you can really focus on that defensive game plan because it, it really is. It's two different defensive game plans. And I think this is just personally because they have shut the doors in practice and meetings and they've done a really good job of, of concealing that information. I think it should be Jake Retzloff. I think it needs to be Jake Retzloff, and Jake just needs to understand that a 100-yard pick six when you're about to go up 24-17 is a completely Ugh. unacceptable decision to make when you're at the two-yard line. And so he's got to learn from that, but I think it's Jake Retzloff. I think he gives you the better op- uh, opportunity to win this game against Oklahoma State. Well, we'll find out coming up a little bit later as Greg Rebell joins us after he talks to Kalani Satake. But coming up next, what has changed for the Oklahoma Cowboy, or State Cowboys that turned a 2-2 two and two start to the season to a team controlling their championship destiny? We'll ask the voice of the Cowboys, Dave Hunsiker, next as he joins us. This is Mountain America Credit Union Cougar pregame live on the new skin BYU Sports Network. This is Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's Ben Bagley. Welcome back as BYU gets ready to face their second top 25 opponent in as many weeks in the Oklahoma State Cowboys. We're going to learn more about the Cowboys as we welcome in Dave Hunsiker, the play-by-play voice of the Cowboys. Dave, thanks for joining us. Oh, great to have you here. And let me just say this. The Cougs Care program that your Alumni Association does to benefit the local charities of the schools you visit is about the coolest thing I've ever heard of. I mean, that is what this is supposed to be about, is taking this and turning it into benefiting those who need help and making it a great distraction for the challenging lives that people face. That is about the coolest thing I've ever seen in 30 years in Division One sports. So kudos to you guys for doing that. I think it's just awesome. So cool. That's, that's great. I, I know a couple of the guys from the Alumni Association that head that up, and that's a big thing for them, and it's something that they've really focused on this year. And, and, and uh, They've been doing it for years, but really wanted to make it a, a big splash with it to, in helping the uh, the Big 12 opponents as we, we do our fr- inaugural trip around the Big 12. So so kudos to the Alumni Association for, for doing a great job with that this season. Let's talk a little bit about Oklahoma State and the Cowboys as BYU and the Cowboys face off today. This 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 Oklahoma State team has been good, but their two two of their three losses have just been head scratchers. Yeah, uh, to, to University of Southern Alabama and to also UCF. What has been the difference in this Cowboy team between those games where it's just a head scratching loss and these other other games where they're a pretty dominant force in the Big Twelve? Well, I'll, I'll sort of use a, a broad brush here a little bit because those two games were very different because of when they were played so let's just sort of focus I guess on what Oklahoma State needs to do or have happen to be successful a big thing has been when they changed to the power run game and went heavy into that after the loss of South Alabama things got better and that's when Ollie Gordon really took off and a big part of that is what they do on first down I know that's a big deal but for Oklahoma State it's a huge deal in their wins, they've averaged somewhere between six and a half and seven yards per first down play. When you're doing that, the defense is in constant run pass conflict, and you've got them exactly where you want them. In the losses, that's been down somewhere around three to three and a half yards per first down play. This team does not want to get behind the chains. They want no part of that. And so that's a, that's a huge piece to the puzzle. And then another part of that is Alan Bowman, you, you'll watch him on video and say, oh my gosh, he does some funky things with his footwork and you look at this, you look at that, and, you know, it's, it's not a guy that will wow you with any NFL capability. I don't mean that to insult him at all. But he's only been sacked five times. That's the fewest by any FBS quarterback with more than 300 attempts. By far the fewest. And so he'll just throw it out of bounds. You'll see it today. He doesn't like what he sees. He'll just throw it about three rows deep, go to the next play instead of taking a sack. So the change to the power run game, the lack of negative plays, both in tackles for loss and sacks is is a huge, huge thing. And 
and then defensively, you know, trying to manage the big plays the Cowboys have given up. That has been a huge issue, especially in the past game. They're in the first year of a new defensive scheme, and, and that's been tricky at times, but uh, that's been an ongoing problem, giving up big plays, and that's what happened at UCF. They got behind. It started raining. You're behind the chains trying to move the ball in the rain. You're way behind, et cetera, et cetera, and it just sort of snowballed, but this team can't live in the world of playing behind the chains. That is second and third and long. That's just not who they are. So, David, as far as health, how healthy has this team been all year, and how healthy are they coming into this one? You know, it's funny. It's it's sort of odd the way it's played out. They had some guys they lost for the season early. Deshaun Stribling, transfer from Washington State, was their best receiver. They lost him in the off week back at the end of September. They lost a starting safety, Lyric Rawls, for the season. Those were huge injuries. Uh, now they've lost Jason Brooks, one of their starting guards for the season due to injury. That's about three weeks ago. So they've had these, and then they had a big flurry of receiver injuries in October. Jaden Bray was out. They lost Stribling. uh, They lost Blaine Green. Now the crazy thing is, while they're not getting those guys back that they lost for the year, they're probably as healthy as they've been since probably the first part of October. Again, taking out the guys that they lost for the season. So it's really strange to be sitting here Thanksgiving weekend and say, well, our health is better. That is highly unusual. Usually they get to this time of the year and you're just, you know, the guys are limping around and, and uh, you know, barely able to play. But they're better off than they were because, you know, by, by just great fortune, they got through the end of October and early November when they were really, really beat up. Let's look at Ollie Gordon. Uh, this is a guy who kind of on the national scene burst in early this season. But uh, from from a guy who's covered this team for a while, yeah. was there indications coming into the season that he was going to have the season he has right now where he's a Heisman hopeful, probably going to win the Doak Walker, and, and just being one of the best offensive threats in the nation? Well, this team rotated three quarterbacks early, and they also rotated three running backs, Ollie Gordon, Jaden Nixon, who's more of a fast home run threat, although Ollie is plenty of a home run threat on his own, and Elijah Collins, who transferred in from Michigan State. And there didn't appear to be any separation between those three. What changed is, is when they got to the end of September and they became much more dedicated to the gap run schemes, the power run game, that fits Ollie Gordon to a T. He is an old school, eye formation, downhill runner. That suits him. That was best for the offensive line. It really fit in with what Oklahoma State needed to do from a run game standpoint, and that's when he exploded. And I think to not give credit to the offensive line, which really did not play very well early but has really grown and take off. Joe Mahalski at center is having an all-Big 12 caliber season. Dalton Cooper at left tackle has been very good. And then you add to that, you know, guys that really get hidden that are huge in this equation, the tight end, specifically Deshaun Johnson, transferred in from UMass. They've done some things from a formation and motion standpoint with a tight end that have been a huge pain in the neck for opponents. You don't know where that tight end is going or what he's doing, and consequently I think what happens many times is, you know, guys don't get lined up right. All of a sudden, you know, you get the second level block, the safety's out of position, that's where it turns into 60 or 70, and that's what we've seen. So it's collective. Yes, Ollie Gordon is an extraordinary talent, but the offensive line has really grown up. Got, you know what they've done with the tight ends formationally has been huge and the way those tight ends you know specifically Johnson and Cassidy have blocked is that's been huge as all this uh, run game has exploded so it's collective to, to say that it's just Ollie would be unfair to those other guys I wanted to talk to you about Brian Nardo first year defensive coordinator um, get a couple of thoughts from you because I was watching Central Florida and the RPOs that Central Florida was running and their quarterback style, it's kind of what Jake Retzloff does. It's kind of an Aaron Roderick form. And they gave up a lot of yards to Central Florida. They've given up a lot of yards throughout the year, 30 points to Houston. They gave up a lot of points to West Virginia and Kansas, even in those wins. Where is Mike Gundy with Brian Nardo? Where are you with Brian Nardo and what he's done so far this season? You know, I think they'll be fine. You know, we went through this 2018 with Jim Knowles, who's now the defensive coordinator at Ohio State, and the first year was really rough. It was really, really rough, and in some ways considerably worse than this. I mean, we've given up a lot of big plays this year, and believe it or not, 2018 was worse. And there was some doubt about, okay, is Jim the guy? It took time for him to get that system in place, And when you had a group of guys that had started in the system together for multiple seasons, then 2021 happened. Regular season Big 12 champs beat Notre Dame in the Fiesta Bowl. 
you know, barely missed on a trip to the college football playoff. So it takes time. And I think everyone is drifting more in the conference toward that Iowa State style of defense, that three-man front with an umbrella and a rover, for lack of a better description. It's, it, it's been problematic. Of course, now teams are countering that with tight ends and mm-hmm. lots of shifts and motions and things of that nature. But, you know, they've had some youth in the back end. You know, and honestly, some guys probably haven't played as well as they would have expected. They lost Lyric Rawls, one of the starting safeties. But in the UCF game, about the worst thing that could happen happened on the first play. They hit a deep ball for about 35 yards. I thought the speed of UCF at receiver was really problematic uh, for Oklahoma State that day. And then the rain came, and, you know, John Rice Pumley had not been healthy. That was the most healthy he had been in a while, and uh, he was really, really good that day. But that's a concern. You know, it's... I'm interested to see what happens today. I was watching the OU video again this morning of your offense, BYU, and it looked like all the motioning and shifts. OU wasn't really even getting lined up. I mean, the snap would happen. They still got guys trying to figure out where to line up. So the thing is, Oklahoma State on offense does a lot of the same things, not the same terms of plays, but a lot of the motions and shifts. So at least they're used to seeing that because it's what the Cowboys do every day. It's a different thing in terms of, you know, zone read option. What you guys did last week, we don't do that. So, you know, that helps a little bit. But, yeah, there's concerns there because they have given up big plays. And, and, and again, somehow, for the most part, they've dodged that and been able to win games because normally you, you don't get away with that. Well, Dave, we appreciate your time and looking forward to a great game today for both squads and have a good call. Thank you. It's great to have you guys here. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Dave. You bet. Coming up next, the Cougars had success last week in the run game against the Sooners. What made them successful and what can they do again today? It's X's and Olsen's, well, X's and Olsen with hands coming up next. You're listening to the new skin BYU Sports Network. Let's get you back to Ben Bagley and Hans Olsen for more Cougar Pregame Live. Brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Welcome back. I'm Ben Bagley with Hans Olsen, who joins us from Boone Pickens Stadium in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And it's time for X's and Olsen. Hans, last week, BYU found success in the run game against Oklahoma. How did they do it? And will we be able to see it again for the first time pretty much this season in back-to-back weeks? A lot of different factors that played into it, Ben. Uh, I think that couple have been publicized maybe a couple not as much but one that was pretty much publicized Aaron Roderick talked about it he believed that Oklahoma was preparing for two different quarterbacks and had some preparation for Keaton Slovis and also looked at BYU's run production and thought you know what we're just going to take that pass away make sure they don't beat us through the air and I don't think that their defensive game plan was as oriented to stopping the run game as it probably should have been. So caught them off guard maybe a little bit in game prep and what they expected to see from BYU. And I think that that still looms against Oklahoma State. I'm hoping that Brian Nardo has had to put it together a couple of different defensive game plans. Number two, Aiden Robbins' health has gotten better and better and better as the season's gone along. He had some early health issues And I think that that's hampered him more than we ever thought that it hampered him. So once Aiden got in there and I think got his feet going, broke a couple of runs, started feeling good, I think that that really aided in what he was able to do in that game against Oklahoma. Number three, I do believe that the threat of Jake Retzloff in the run game is opening things up because you have to keep your defensive ends on an outside contain look. They've got to stay on the outside of the tackle, or if the tight end's on their side, they've got to slide to the inside shade of the tight end. But they can't play to the inside. They have to slide just a little bit wider. And when you do that, now your will linebacker or your rover linebacker, they have to slide just a little bit wider. And they've got to be on the outside shades because if Jake Retzloff takes that thing to the outside, then, you know, you're giving up that soft shoulder, and that's just an easier first down. So as they slid a little bit, 
Retzloff was doing a really good job of recognizing their alignment and just giving it to Aiden, and Aiden was doing a fantastic job of reading the zone gaps and taking off. And sometimes those gaps were separating on the backside of the zone blocking. They did a much better job on the backside seal block. So those gaps were, those zone gaps were opening on the backside of the center away from the direction of the run. So Aiden Robbins was able to cut back a few times, and then sometimes they were opening up on the play side. And then just to point one guy out, I thought it was Braden Kimes' best game at that tackle position. Braden Kimes multiple times drove his guy 8, 10 yards, and was able to get up to the next line of defense, pick up linebackers, open up more gaps. So great job by Braden Kimes. Great job by the game plan. I loved Aiden Robbins' commitment to the ground game and, and his belief in himself, and it just picked up. There, but there were a lot of factors that played into it, Ben. I really liked you. I think you mentioned one thing outside of Braden Kime, but also the almost the entire offensive line. It seemed like they were playing with a, a physicality that we hadn't seen uh, to that extent yet this season where they were dominating the D-line and the front seven for Oklahoma. And then with Aiden Robbins, you mentioned it. I felt like as he got more momentum going and going, he ran harder downhill and had a little bit of a step that he didn't have. And I'm not saying this in a bad way. He didn't have it at the first of the game. He hadn't had it all season. But as the momentum got going, he just was looking to, mm-hmm. to for holes hitting holes quickly, and then looking for contact and, and, and advancing the ball after contact down the field. Yeah, he was. It was, it was really great, just his, his effort and his vision. I, I also will point out that there were multiple keeps by Retzloff in that game that extended drives where you, you thought that it was going to be downhill, you thought it was going to be more of a run game, but he kept and took it off the edge and extended a few drives. So, he did a better job of mixing up his gives and his keeps. He did a better job of reading when he should have his gives and his keeps. And I think that played out well. Just got to clean up those three big mistakes. And two of those, you know, probably you, you could look at him and say, well, that, that's on you. One of those turnovers I don't think was as much on him. I think it was on a receiver and the route that he decided to run. So those receivers need to make sure that they're on the ball against Oklahoma State. The other thing that I'll point out, and it's something that Dave, the voice of the Pokes, just pointed out, Oklahoma was trying to adjust to a lot of the movements, and they weren't getting down and in their stance fast enough, and that was giving an offensive line just enough time to get off the edge on them. So I, I would imagine Oklahoma State has watched that film, and they're going to get their shifts and their stims quickly before that snap comes so that they're kind of in place and ready to take on those double teams and not get pushed back like Oklahoma did. But the the thing that I love, Ben, I love the fact that we saw BYU outmatch Oklahoma in the physicality and the the, just the physical department. And and that wasn't something I expected. You know, you're talking about Oklahoma's offensive line, Oklahoma defensive lineman. Man, we don't get pushed around out here. Well, BYU outmatched them physically and with physicality and it was nice to see that BYU can still match up with the best in the trench because Oklahoma's offensive line is one of the best now West Virginia's offensive line man they just beat up the BYU trench Iowa State's offensive line they beat up that BYU trench but it was nice to see BYU match grit with Oklahoma last week and and you hope that it plays out again today that's what I want Ben that's what I want. I just want to see BYU's offensive and defensive fronts, not the lines, but the fronts. That includes the tight ends. That includes the outside linebackers. That includes anybody that's coming up in the trench. That includes fullbacks. That includes anything that you're looking at. I want BYU to outmatch them, out-physical them, outpower them, get off the ball, get in their chest, force them back, and make this a long day for Oklahoma State, like you did for Oklahoma. Oklahoma was sweating that game. That whole night, they were sweating that game. Or, I guess, whole day, morning, they were sweating that game. You know, you got to make Oklahoma State do the same. Yeah, nothing's got to get – nothing can come easy for 
Oklahoma State, much like nothing came easy last week for Oklahoma. Hey, coming up next, Jason Shepard sits down and talks to the aforementioned Aiden Robbins. But before that, let's pause 10 seconds for station identification on the BYU News Skin Sports Network. This is BYU Radio on KBYU FM HD2 Provo. You're listening to BYU Football on BYU Radio. Jason Shepard sits down with BYU running back Aiden Robbins. We'll hear that conversation coming up next with Shep Talk on the new skin BYU Sports Network. You're tuned to Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Ben Bagley. Welcome back. After high expectations heading into this season, Aiden Robinson unfortunately missed several weeks of the season with a rib injury. Since coming back, he's provided glimpses of getting back to the 1,000-yard rusher he was at UNLV. Last week was his best game as a Cougar, and he's hoping that he will ha- he and his team will rep- replicate that this weekend in Stillwater. Jason Shepard talked with Aiden Robinson about that and more in this weekend's edition of Shep Talk. I know sometimes it's very difficult to see the improvement when you don't win a game. Are you able to see the improvement that the offense made and that the running game made, even though you lost the game? Oh, absolutely. Um, Saturday, I felt like, you know, that was kind of, that's what we do, man. That's how I saw brand of football here at BYU. I mean, obviously we didn't get the outcome we wanted. And, you know, that was just really due to, to, to turnovers. I feel like we eliminate those turnovers. Is, there's no way we lose that game, man. And that just kind of shows. And, I mean, that's, that was a good opponent we played. We played a really good opponent on Saturday. You know, a blue blood team. But, you know, that doesn't matter to us. We, we're not interested in logos or whatever. But bottom line, Saturday, I feel like we kind of executed, especially in the run game. Uh, we were explosive in the passing game as well. And, you know, we were just putting, we were just putting everything together, man. And, uh, you know, that just kind of shows where, where I, not where our ceiling is, but it, just, it does kind of show, you know, where our potential lies. What was the biggest difference? Why did things click so well in the run game where it had been so inconsistent previous to? <laughs> if I'm being honest, man, that is a great question. It just, it was just one of those days, I think, man, um, and then not to mention, I mean, our quarterback, Jake Grenslov, you know, he he opens up the run game a little bit because now teams have to actually respect the, the, the RPO. When you talked about, you know, playing a blue blood and realizing that you had some self-inflicted, you know, issues that you probably win that game if you don't have, from a confidence standpoint, it sounds like you guys are really sort of tapping into that and feel pretty good about the way that you guys played. How how much can that confidence build into this week against Oklahoma State? Yeah, I mean, we, we never really lost confidence. We always knew what we were capable of. Obviously, I mean, a loss is a loss. Uh, it doesn't matter how much you lose by a loss is a loss. We, every game we go into, we're expecting to win. Like, like, I, like I said earlier, I mean, we're not interested in logos. We don't really care what the logo looks like or, or anything, man. I mean, we, we, we're BYU. <laughs> we got the logo too so yeah we walk into every game um expecting to win man and that's how we're gonna go into this game saturday confident and, and, and expecting to win with a good with a good week of practice and preparation you were honored on senior day now you do have an option to come back if you want so you you have that decision to make but i, I do want to ask what that experience was like uh being honored you know on senior day yeah, it was a great experience. It was a little different. Um, I had never been honored like after the game. Man, it was it was good for me, man, because you know my mother and my father were there. Uh, my lady was there, man, and I can't even tell you the last time my mother and father had been there in in the flesh to watch me play, man, like yeah. together. Uh, my mom had came to one game earlier in the season. My dad had came to one. He had came to the second game. Uh, this was before, obviously, I broke my rib. Yeah, man, I mean, it meant a lot to me. Like, I truly cannot tell you the last time that both of my parents were there physically to watch me play. In high school, senior day, they were both there, but I had just had labrum surgery, so I wasn't even playing. But, yeah, I mean, it, it was big for me, man. I was like, man, my parents is here. I don't know how many chances I'm going to get for my parents to actually be there. So that, that meant a lot to me, man. And maybe they're the secret sauce. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so take me through the opportunity you guys have. I know you guys, you've been trying to get that sixth win for a while. Does it help that things get simplified this week, that you have one chance to get it, and it's all on this one game? Does that help in simplifying things for you and getting that sixth win in bowl eligibility? 
Uh, sure. You know, if you want to put it that way, yeah, sure. But, um, you know, every week we kind of look at it as one game season, one game season. We're not worried about the next week or who we play the next week. We're all like Iowa State week, we're worried about Iowa State. Well, West Virginia week, worried about them. Last week, we're just worried about Oklahoma. Uh, we try not to, you know, look too forward, look too far ahead. And then, you know, we just keep our feet, keep, you know, keep our head where our feet's at, man. What do you know about Oklahoma State? This is a team that, that struggled out of the gate, got into a nice little rhythm. Uh, they're coming off of a victory. Well, what do you know about the Cowboys that you'll face in Stillwater this weekend? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a good squad. You know, we, we respect every opponent we play, no matter who it is, no matter what level they're at. We respect every opponent we play, potentially a hostile environment. I've never been to Stillwater, Oklahoma. Um, they're recruiting me out of the portal, though. Um, you know, they're, they're coached well. Obviously, they have a, you know, a Hall of Fame head coach right now. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're expecting a good game, man. We're expecting them to come out. You know, they're they're playing for, for a championship berth and we're playing for a bowl berth, man. So there's there's stakes on both ends. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot on the line for both of these teams. Are you guys uh, tapping into uh, to Caleb Etienne this week to try and get some sort of scouting report on Oklahoma State? <laughs> uh, we might. We might. Um, we'll see. What he, I mean, you know, I'll ask him something, obviously. But, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see where his head's at and what he knows. All right, let's wrap things up with the final four questions. First question is, what's your favorite ice cream flavor and when was the last time you had it? Favorite ice cream flavor is cookies and cream. Uh, when was the last time I had it? I want to say a couple weeks, probably. I'm telling you, I, I say this every week. This is now the 12th interview that I've done, obviously, for this season. I would say at least 10 have said cookies and cream. Like, that is the flavor, without question. It's the best flavor. I mean, it's it's without a given. I mean, obviously, you're going to have guys that's like, oh, sherbet or some crazy flavor. Yeah. But, man, look, who doesn't like cookies? If you like Oreos or mm-hmm. how can you mm-hmm. not like cookies and cream, bro? I, I don't know. but. All right, uh, dog person or cat person? Dog, dog person. I had two Ger- two German Shepherds like when I was a baby, and then I have like a a te- it's, it's a teddy bear. I don't know if you're familiar with the teddy bears, but it's a Bichon Freeze and a Shih Tzu mix. Um, mm. I have one at home. We had got him when I was in eighth grade, I think, going into ninth grade. Man, he's, he's still rolling. He's probably like what? He's a middle aged man in dog years. <laughs> uh, the equivalent to human years, he's probably around fifty six. <laughs> Wow. So, <laughs> All right. Uh, you're only allowed to subscribe to one streaming service. Which one are you subscribing to? I'm going Netflix. You yeah, that's what? been the popular answer. Or, or you know what? Potentially YouTube TV. It, yeah, I'm going to throw that in there. That's a that's a yeah. wild card because YouTube TV is going to have all the games, football, basketball, whatever sports you like. And, it, you know, it has TV. It's cable, too. Yeah. Cable. yeah YouTube TV is really cable in its own. Hey, you don't need, you don't need to sell me. I'm a subscriber, so I, I get you on that one. All right, last one, Aiden. <laughs> last one. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's wrap it up with this. What has it meant to you to be part of BYU's first P5 season in the Big 12? It's huge, man. Um, obviously, the season hasn't been what we wanted, but... Man, it is truly an honor to be a part of the inaugural season because, I mean, there's there's only always going to be one first team, you know? You know, I'm just happy to say that I'm I'm here, man. It kind of hit me on Saturday. I'm like, man, like this, I really came full circle because, I, you know, I was supposed to come here out of high school and I'm here now. You know, four yeah. four years later, I'm I'm here. And <laughs> It's crazy. It's just, it's just crazy how life works. Absolutely. Aiden, thank you so much for taking a few minutes. Number one, I'm glad you're healthy. I'm really glad that you had the performance uh, that you had last week. And uh, good luck this week. And uh, let's go get that sixth win in Stillwater. Thanks, man. Yes, sir. Thank you. Jason Shepard there with BYU running back Aiden Robbins. Hoping to see more from what we saw last week today for Aiden Robbins. Coming up next, two Big 12 games in the book from Black Friday, plus the rest of the conference action today. The Big 12 Blitz is next. You're tuned in to Mountain America Credit Union pregame live on the new skin BYU Sports Network. Tune to Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Ben Bagley. Mountain America Credit Union, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Welcome back in with myself and Hans Holson here, getting you ready for BYU as they prepare to face Oklahoma State in today's regular season and hopefully not season finale of BYU football. Hans, let's take a quick look 
at the Big 12 scoreboard, the funky post-Thanksgiving weekend where you got games on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, kind of the extended football weekend in college football, two big scores from last night in on Black Friday. First, you get uh, you get Oklahoma in a shootout with TCU. By the way, another 75-yard pick six for Oklahoma to help in the way to the victory there uh, for the OU defense. But they get they get the win over TCU 69-45, and then Texas blows out Texas Tech 57 to seven, which set, which sets up an interesting scenario today to figure out who's going to the Big 12 championship game, which means if BYU wins, upsets Oklahoma State, the Sooners take on Texas in the Big 12 championship game. So we see a all-future SEC Big 12 championship game, whereas if the Cowboys beat the the Cougars today, they go in to face Texas in the Big 12 championship game. So that would be a, a really interesting matchup for sure if Oklahoma State does it. Oklahoma State has not played Texas through the year. That was the one team that they really avoided, and they did play Oklahoma, and that was the match. That was the 27-24 win for Oklahoma State. Kind of shook the college world. Oklahoma was looking really strong at the time, and Oklahoma State was able to get the advantage there and then got the advantage earlier in the season against Kansas State. That was a win Kansas State had to have, and that was a one-score game as well. So beating Kansas State by a score, beating Oklahoma by a score, that gives them the edge and the tiebreaker to be your Big 12 championship game if uh, if Oklahoma State can get past BYU. Yeah, and that's going to be that, that's why I think all all eyes of the Big Twelve conference are there on Stillwater BYU. It's the it's the only Big Twelve game in this early afternoon window in the Big Twelve, so everybody's watching. But I, I think I think you got maybe some conference uh, officials and and the Big Twelve just people who love the Big Twelve conference. Like, please don't let it be an all SEC final. But then you got the, the BYU contingent. Like, we don't really care about the future SEC final. We want a bowl game. Yeah. So BYU, go get the job done in Stillwater. Uh, so that, that makes that kind of fun, a little bit of a side story for today's game. Hey, one game uh, early in the Big 12 th- this morning, and it's Houston and UCF, two, the two other newcomers into the conference. And right now, UCF is up 27-10 to 10 on Houston with 2.30 left in the third quarter. And UCF, with a 17-point lead, looking to do what BYU is going to be looking to do today, and that's become bowl eligible. They'll be the only other bowl eligible team of the newcomers, so... BYU's got to find a way to match that. It'd be nice to see two of the newcomers get their way to bowl eligibility. I tell you, if you would have asked me through the four who's most likely, I would have said probably BYU, and I said Central Florida maybe second. Um, I, there were times through the season I thought Cincinnati had a pretty decent team, but they have really struggled. And, you know, Houston has had their moments. Um, they've had their moments in the Big 12. They're 2-6. and six. They're going to finish the season two and seven but they got a nice win against baylor they had an early win against west virginia so houston found a couple of wins in the big 12 against a west virginia team that byu couldn't get past and a baylor team that byu was able to avoid so hopefully byu can match what central florida is doing right now and extend their season by one more game And later tonight, three other games in the Big 12, West Virginia at Baylor, number 25, Kansas at Cincinnati, and Iowa State at number 21, Kansas State. And that will wrap up the Big 12 slate for the final regular season weekend of the college football season. Coming up next, we'll visit with the voice Greg Rebell. Mountain America Credit Union pregame live continues next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America. On the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's Ben Bagley. Welcome back. Joining us now is the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rebell, as we get you ready for BYU uh, as they have looked for the, look to get a victory in their regular season finale at number 20, Oklahoma State. Greg, let's start the, today's conversation right where we started last week's. So what's the update on the quarterback situation? Keaton's getting closer, Ben, and hi, Ben, but uh, not 100% yet, according to Kalani Sitake in our pregame chat. But uh, Keaton's more available today than he was last week, and he says, you know what, Greg, last game, everything's a possibility today. All hands on deck, and if, uh, if, if BYU needs to go to Keaton for one reason or another, he'll be available. 
there's not a necessarily designed rotation in effect today, meaning Jake Retzloff gets to start, and if things are going well, uh, Jake Retzloff would be continued to re- remain in that role today. But if BYU, for any reason, needs a change, they could make a change to Keaton Slovis. So Retzloff gets start number four at the tail end of this season. Uh, everyone else on the uh, on the offense, I'll, you know, I, I hate the phrase skill position because O-linemen are very skilled. But, uh, Thank tight you, Greg. Thank yeah, you. You bet. Uh, tight ends, <laughs> wide receivers, uh, running backs, pretty much all available today. The big change is on the offensive line. And and with Ke- with Kingsley Suamataia not available today, this will mean, Ben, and hands and listeners, that BYU will not have had a single lineman who started every game this season. There was not one lineman who will have started every game this year. That is one of the reasons BYU's had the difficulties they've had on offense. Kingsley Suamataia was the only player to have made every start, but it'll be 11 starts and not 12. He will not play today's not even on the trip. So, offensive line, left to right, Braden Kime, Paul Mile, Connor Pay, Waylon Lapuahu, Caleb Etienne. Now, Caleb has gotten starts this year. In fact, uh, Caleb started the first three games of the year at right tackle. Has since gotten just one start. It came against West Virginia, which was Jake Retzloff's first start at quarterback. And now ETN is back in the starting lineup against his old team. He transferred from Oklahoma State. But uh, the headline here is zero offensive linemen started all 12 games this year. Yeah, and I think that start against West Virginia was at the guard position. So three starts at the tackle, one start at the guard position, correct? Wasn't he at the guard position against West Virginia? Yes, he was right guard against yeah. uh, against the Mountaineers. Yeah, yeah. so tough there. I, I do want to just really go back to the uh, quick go back to the Jake Retzloff uh, conversation. Does this make it a, a short turnover leash for Jake Retzloff? Does he feel the pressure because of what happened last week with three turnovers? Yeah. Does he feel that pressure? If, if Oklahoma State is scoring points off of BYU turnovers, and that's been the problem. It's not just that BYU is turning it over. It's what's happening on the back end of those turnovers. Teams are scoring touchdowns. Last week it was an immediate touchdown on a pick six, but the other two touchdown, the other two giveaways resulted in touchdowns. Teams are doing too much with what BYU is doing in terms of ball security, and uh, it's not all Jake. There were reasons BYU turned the ball over last week that weren't exclusively Jake Retzloff, but he has five giveaways in, in three starts, and um, I guess it really depends on how this game's complexion looks at the time. But uh, yeah, I, I, not that there's no accountability because turnovers and takeaways happen, but. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things you get with Keaton Slovis is poise and to kind of been there, done that, and seen all kinds of situations. Not, not that Keaton hasn't turned the ball over. Keaton's turned the ball over. Everyone's turned the ball over. But uh, Jake's got to get, kind of get a rein on that. Um, never were, were the takeaways or the giveaways for BYU more damaging than last week. It's really, you could argue, um, with the exception of the, of the Dylan Gabriel injury, uh, the only reason Oklahoma won that game was in a position where it was because of BYU, uh, B- BYU giveaways. Um, if Dylan Gabriel plays a whole game, who knows? Maybe Oklahoma's got a little more wiggle room. But as it turned out, the turnovers are the reason, the reason, Oklahoma beat BYU last week. Well, just going, to, going off what I perceive of Jake Retzloff, I, I think he's a gamer, and I think he's a guy that responds to pressure, that a guy that responds to adversity, not a guy that collapses because of it. So my guess is and my hope is that he responds well to that type of pressure because that is going to loom on your back. I I had a coach tell me, you give up contain one more time, I'm not playing you the rest of the year. One more time. So what you do, Greg, is you focus very, very intently on keeping contain so you can play the game. So Jake Retzloff has to just focus on making good decisions. Don't turn it over. And we know what was his fault yeah. He knows what was his he, fault. He's not reckless. Yes. And, and not every turnover last week was, was his fault Was his at fault. All. And coaches know what's his fault. So I want people to understand. If people see, like, two turnovers and they're like, make the change, understand it's got to be his decision, his turnover, his fault. And there was one in particular that just wasn't last. Right. Now, there's no doubt. The decision to throw on the goal line you cannot make. And, and some will say, well, that's a reckless decision. But how, in the moment, in tempo, young player, third star, it's just there was a lot going on in the moment. He thought he saw something that wasn't there. Ultimately, there's kind of a hard line in the sand. You do not throw the ball on goal line in that situation. He did at cost BYU. But I don't think he's a guy that's out there just willy-nilly chucking it around with no care. Um, every turnover has its own characteristic. And, and I, I, I do love Jake Retzloff. And I, I think... Ben, he does still give BYU the best shot um, because of what he brings in quarterback run game. It's not a coincidence that BYU's best rushing games 
are coming at the end of the year with Jake Retzloff in a quarterback. It just makes the run game better. It just does. And it's, well, not just I, his, I, it's not just his yards, Ben. He has a decent number of yards, but it's not just the fact that he's adding yards to the total. It's what it does to the defenders that have to deal with him. Exactly, and I think Mike Gundy talked about that a lot this week in his media availability, talking about he kept referencing it as a triple option, the way you bring in a triple option in it. And, and in a way it is. It's not like the, the, the traditional triple option when you think Air Force or Navy or, or one, of the, the, one of the academies. But it is where, where Retzloff can either do the RPO or, but there's also that, and, and one of these resulted in a fumble last week, which was you're looking at the pitch guy coming around. So what with Retzloff going off the edge or the possibility of a pitch coming off the edge, your, your edges on the defensive lines have to stay, and they can't crash down in the middle, which is opening up lanes for Aiden Robbins. Right, exactly right. And by the way, Aiden Robbins, uh, people wonder, well, is L.J. Martin okay? And uh, the answer is yes. It's just that the way Aiden's running right now, he's the guy. And he's coming off his, uh, his BYU career best game last week. On, on the defensive side, Greg, oh, that, the health, we're looking like at a full defensive squad coming in today for Oklahoma or against Oklahoma State? No, Ethan Slade got hurt last week, and, and I don't think he's on the trip either. So BYU's down. And, man, the, the, the safety spot just got hammered this year, just nonstop. And so uh, the good news is the absence of Ethan Slade coincides with the return of Talon Alfrey. So we'll look for Talon to get his first start in his third game back from an upper body injury that kept him out for the first nine games of the season. So look for Alfrey and uh, and Wakely at safety, Ben, with uh, with the backups then being DeMooney and Rex. Uh, linebackers, uh, you'll see a lot of two linebacker today, but I think Harrison Taggart will come back into a more prominent role. Ace Kafusi could see, actually, see, you could see a lot of Ace Kafusi today, Ben. Uh, no Ciale Acera. Ciale suffered a lower body injury. He's going to be out probably through the spring. And so that was a tough blow for BYU. Uh, don't be surprised, too, if you see a little more of Logan Lutui. You might even see Logan start at defensive end opposite Tyler Batty. Banya had been the guy starting, but I think Logan Lutui's made enough strides to be uh, getting a lot more reps and probably starting at right end today. All right, Greg, thanks so much for the updates. Look forward to the call with you and Hans coming up here. Yeah, well, we'll be handing it off to you guys here in about 20 minutes. So thanks so much, and we'll talk to you guys in just a moment. Thanks, Always a ben. pleasure, Ben. Thank you. All right, Mitch Jurgens joins me on the other side. But f- uh, uh, here in just a moment, this is the New Skin BYU Sports Network. Let's get you back to Ben Bagley and Hans Olsen for more Cougar Pregame Live. Brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. The BYU Cougars getting ready to face the 20th ranked Oklahoma State Cowboys in Stillwater, Oklahoma. I'm joined right now by sideline reporter Mitch Jurgens. Mitch, it's a big game for both teams. You got one team in BYU fighting for an opportunity to extend their season with bowl eligibility, and you got the other team in Oklahoma State either winning and moving on to the Big 12 championship game or losing and just seeing what comes next in a bowl, bowl game. Yeah, yeah, Ben, I expect a lot. Uh, I mean, being down on the field, a ton of energy from both sides. Um, you know, BYU uh, putting themselves in a position to compete last week, uh, coming up just short. I would imagine that the that the energy, the fire that they're going to bring is like, look, we can't ha- we can't drop another game being so close to a bowl game for now five straight weeks. Um, I expect a lot of energy. And on the flip side, I mean, this is this is an Oklahoma State team that. They want to get to that Big 12 championship. So, uh, yeah, you couldn't draw it up any better. Um, this is it's going to be a, a pretty pretty intense game, and BYU's got their work cut out for them today. Oh, well, it's interesting. I, I mentioned earlier you talk about the energy expected in this game from both sides. I think on the Oklahoma State side, I told Hans that I expect the Cowboys to come out on fire, knowing what's on the line. Oh, yeah. uh, fi- fi- senior night, senior day for for the Cowboys. Everything else, there's going to be a lot of motion on that sideline. And BYU, I think, is going to take a big punch early. It's just if they counter punch and keep right in the middle of the ring with these guys to steal all these boxing terms. But let me let me ask you this: as a former player, you play against Oklahoma. You frankly, you outplay Oklahoma last week. Some some costly turnovers end up. You don't win that game. You've had a rough season. And you go in for the final game as a player. What's your mentality as you're walking out of the tunnel, getting ready for kickoff? Yeah, you know, you've got to stay together as a team. Um, I mean, that's one of the biggest things. You start to see when adversity hits, right? 
are you going to be an organization that points the fingers? Um, a player that's like, look, it's it's not my fault that we're in this four game skid, um, that it's been a tough season. It's it's got to be somebody else. Like uh, that that stuff can't happen. And, and and again, I'm not saying that that is happening, uh, but from a player's perspective, like there's a lot of power that can come from a team just sticking together. Um, this is it, it's everybody knew coming into this season that it was going to be a tough schedule it was going to be a a big adjustment to the big 12 and and i think those players need to have that um have that uh, short-term memory of kind of the 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 tough games and the tough learning experiences but have a long-term outlook that look we're building this from the ground um we can put byu in a position to continuously compete year after year but you know, the expectation wasn't that this team was going to get to the Big 12 championship, um, you know, in their first year as a member of the Big 12. So you got to stay together as a team and, and go out and just and love the game and play the game. Um, I, I think, you know, I go back, I played 39 games. Um, I played 13 each year, never missed a game in my three years that I played. And I still come out here and, and you know, on, on the being on the broadcast, this is a blast, but... I would much rather go back and put on the helmet. And, and I think if players can remember that, like in the moment, this is going to pass uh, or time's going to pass. It's going to fly by way too fast. Um, go out, play the game, love the game. And honestly, the, the players that love it, that want to be there, they're going to be the ones that make the big play in the big moment and potentially help this team make a comeback and, and, and be in a position to upset a, a team that's trying to get to the big 12 championship so you got to stick together and then just love and play the game with with everything that the, everything that you have and uh y- you know you can fully expect some good things to happen on the field i said it earlier and and, and you can agree or disagree with me on this one but I, I thought that with the game last week against oklahoma that the cougars did outplay oklahoma on a play-by-play basis the scoreboard is what it is but i thought byu did a great job for the for the first time this season and really stepping up and outplaying a team out physically out just just seemed like BYU was the better team on the field last week how do they take that performance last week and duplicate it without the turnovers and the costly mistakes and come out with a win today in a still water yeah go, going back to the the post game interviews um AJ Vong Pachong said something that I that I absolutely loved, and I can't remember what the question was, but he made a comment in response to a question that was, "Hey, we're just here to focus on us. Like it's always been about BYU. It's never been about Oklahoma. It's never been about Oklahoma State or about any other opponent. It's always been about us. Um, and and I think if BYU wants to replicate that performance today, they have to look internally." They need to do, every individual on the team needs to do their job to the best of their ability. And if they can do that, if they can master that, then everything's going to take care of itself. It doesn't matter what Oklahoma State does, right? They they have a big play. They they come out on top. Just do your job and, 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 and put yourself in a position like last week against Oklahoma where you're not making up. Um, more than a seven-point deficit at any time. Uh, I think that was the that was crucial in, in last week's performance again against Oklahoma. The max lead was seven points. Oklahoma scored, BYU answered. Oklahoma scored, BYU answered. Um, and, and and I think it was that to AJ's comments. It was they were just focused on what they could do, what they could control. Um, and I think you have to do that here in this game. Um, the other thing is you've got to start fast, uh, as you mentioned. Oklahoma State, they're going to come in with a ton of firepower. They want to get started as fast as possible, um, and, and BYU can't get behind. I worry that with the four-game skid uh, that, that they're in right now, um, if somehow Oklahoma State jumps out to a 14-0, 21-0 lead, that can kind of deflate this BYU team, um, diminish their self-belief that they can compete, that they can be in this game, and, and then it may not turn out well. And so if they can start fast, put themselves in a position that they're competing at the end of the first quarter, at the end of the second quarter, that it's a game, then I have no doubt um, that this team will continue to fight throughout the rest of the game, knowing what's on the line, that they want to extend their season, uh, but they've got to be able to start fast and 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 do so because I, I think if they do that as well and potentially even get out to an early lead, you force Ollie Gordon, the ball out of Ollie Gordon's hand and into more pass attack heavy approach for the Oklahoma State offense, which 
which if BYU is going to have a chance, that might have to be what happens today. Well, Mitch, I, you mentioned down on the sidelines, it's going to be a little chilly for you. You expect that in November, but you're going to be, I, I think the loudness and the closeness proximity-wise to the the sidelines and the fans there might be able to keep you warm. So just, just good luck down there and go make some friends from Stillwater. Hey, that's the hope. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's tight, uh, tight quarters there, but uh, yeah, going to do my best and, and hopefully enjoy a, a BYU win here. There you go, Mitch. Look forward to your uh, reports from the sideline. On the other side, Cowboy head coach Mike Dun- Gundy talks about why he thought BYU was always a P5 school. That's next on Mountain America Credit Union pregame live on the new skin BYU Sports Network. Let's get you back to Ben Bagley and Hans Olsen for more Cougar Pregame Live. Brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. We're getting ready for BYU and Oklahoma State coming up in here in about 40 minutes from now. Earlier this week, head coach, Oklahoma State head coach Mike Gundy talked to the media in his weekly press conference. And in that press conference, he had something interesting to say about BYU. Yeah, they're a good addition to the league. We mentioned that and. I think that from coast to coast, uh, their logo would um, trigger in most people's minds a Power 5 school forever. I thought they were. I didn't know what Power 5 was or different conferences or levels when I was, you know, junior high and high school and college. I always thought they were a bit, you know, what people considered a big conference school. That's Mike Gundy earlier this week from his press conference buttering up BYU fans. But I... In truth, Mike Gundy, looking growing up, looking he grew up in Oklahoma, and always looked to BYU as a Power Five school, as a big brand school. It'll be interesting to see as they introduce themselves together as conference foes today in Stillwater, how he feels at the end of this one. Hopefully, in the case of BYU fans, hopefully coming out with a respect as BYU walks off with a victory. When we come back, we'll look at some other action in college football. This is Cougar Pregame Live on the new skin BYU Sports Network. BYU in the Big 12 plays right here on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Mountain America Credit Union, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. I'm Ben Bagley, and this is the final segment of the Cougar pregame live. Let's get you caught up on some scores going around college football on the early morning slate in the top 25. The big game at the big house for a chance for whichever wins this team wins this game moves on to the Big Ten Championship and probably the college football playoff. Right now, number three, Michigan, is up 24-17 on number two, Ohio State. That game right now just finished the third quarter heading into the fourth quarter. In the fourth quarter with 8.37 left in the game, number 10, uh, Louisville, trails Kentucky in another rivalry game, 31-24. That game in Louisville and the Cardinal Trail. Uh, in the SEC, a good home game for LSU, 14th ranked in the nation. They are up on Texas A&M, 28-24 in that game. Checking the one game in action from this morning's slate in Big 12 games. An update there as with 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter, UCF still up 27-13 on Houston. UCF gets a win in that game, and they will become bowl eligible BYU looking to do the same uh, later today at Stillwater, Oklahoma against the Cowboys. Coming up next, it's the Zions Bank Cougar pregame coaches show with Greg Rebell and Kalani Satake. You're listening to BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Cougar pregame live was brought to you by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Cougar Pregame Live is also brought to you by Tucano's Brazilian Grill. Phenomenal flavors, a festive setting, and more fun than you can shake a skewer at. Also by Siegfried and Jensen, helping Utah families for over 30 years. This is BYU Football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Stop by your locally owned and operated Big O Tires, the team you trust. Let's join Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Good afternoon, Cougar football fans. And for the first time in BYU football history, we welcome you inside Boone Pickens Stadium in Stillwater, Oklahoma, as today 
BYU and Oklahoma State play their regular season finale with a lot on the line for both teams for BYU. It's one last shot at a sixth win and bowl eligibility for OSU. It's the chance to earn a berth in the Big 12 championship game next Saturday. My name is Greg Rubel. I'll have your play-by-play call today. With me in our broadcast booth is the big man, former BYU and NFL lineman Hans Olsen. And when the Cougars were 5-2, and two, chances of a postseason berth were statistically solid. All BYU had to do was win one of its last five games. Well, four consecutive losses later, now it's do or die. And Hans, uh, last week, the Cougars almost did it. Falling just short in an upset bid against nationally ranked Oklahoma. Now it's nationally ranked Oklahoma State a team that is better on offense than it is on defense. And the way BYU played last week hopefully gives the Cougs the confidence they need to compete with the Cowboys here this afternoon. Well, I've got to imagine that it boosted their heart quite a bit. I've got to imagine that this team has a belief coming out of that Oklahoma game that maybe they didn't previously have. Now, we do have to look at the facts, and the facts are Oklahoma State did beat that Oklahoma team. Yeah. And this Oklahoma State team has the best running back in the country. This Oklahoma State team is well-coached, and they've come together, and they've got a big goal in front of them. But, Greg, I have to look at this BYU team. I say, all right, they were able to shake off the ugliness of three pretty rough games, Texas, Iowa State, and West Virginia, to find themselves a bit against Oklahoma to build that belief. And you just have to carry off of that. You have to – all of you have to believe across the board. If we can – gun with the Oklahoma personnel. They can gun with the Oklahoma State personnel, and they have to believe that to a man. I do. I do after that Oklahoma game. I've got a belief that this team can stay in this game against Oklahoma State today. Coming up next, we'll hear from BYU head coach Kalani Sitake as the Zions Bank Cougar pregame coaches show continues. For 150 years of helping you succeed, Zions Bank is for you. My pregame conversation with the coach is coming up after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Pre-game coaches show continues. Once again, here's Greg Rubel. It has been 47 years since BYU and Oklahoma State last met on the gridiron. It was the 1976 Tangerine Bowl when OSU beat BYU 49-21 in Orlando, later became the Citrus Bowl. A second straight victory for the Cowboys it was over the Cougars following a win in the 1974 Fiesta Bowl. That was BYU's first ever bowl game. But since these two, uh, those two postseason games, these programs have never met. Now they will be almost annual combatants in the Big 12 Conference. Time now for my pregame conversation with BYU head coach Kalani Sitake. It's brought to you by Zions Bank. For 150 years of helping you succeed, Zions Bank is for you. And today, Coach Sitake starts by answering the weekly quarterback question. It's been three straight starts for Jake Retzloff with Keaton Slovis banged up. Does Keaton get back in the saddle today or... Does the JUCO transfer start this win and you're in game for the Cougars? Well, uh, Keaton's still not 100% entirely, but he is practicing and he's got some valuable reps. Uh, Jake will take the first reps and then we'll see what, what we need or if we need Keaton. That's kind of, uh, he's available and ready to go if we, if we need him and, and Jake's ready to go. And uh, there's, a, there's a plan in place. We'll see how the game goes. Backs and tight ends and wide receivers look pretty good. Uh, change on the O-line today for you. Yeah, uh, Kingsley didn't make the trip. He's hurt, so we had to use uh, Braden, Caleb, and Simi to, to take the tackle position. But the interior three with Paul, Connor, and Whaler will still be intact. And defensively, uh, down to safety, it's been a hard-hit position for yeah, you this year yeah. with Ethan Slade now being out. Well, Ethan being out, and uh, so it'll be Talon and crew will be taking the starting reps, and then you'll, they'll be rotating with uh, Preston Rex and Raider DeMuni at, at the free and strong safety. All right. Uh, it's an empty the tank day for BYU, isn't it? It is. It is. I mean, we've got, you know, this is this is it. This is uh, If we want to ex- ex- extend the season, then we need this one. But uh, I want the guys to just focus on, on our values, our standards, and the things that we play with and have, have a great mindset. A, a lot like what we did last week, but with less mistakes. And I think if we can do that, we'll be in a really good spot. Obviously, we're on the road. Uh, but I, th- I think I feel from the guys of the, the urgency, the excitement for this game. And, and I know it's exciting for them because they – they can solidify a, a spot in the championship, Big 12 championship game. Uh, 
It's not about spoiling it for them. It's about us being bowl eligible and extending our season. So, uh, you know, it, this is we'll see what happens. But I know they got a lot to play for, but so do we. Last week was last week. But uh, how much maybe did the way you guys played in, in all phases of the game give you the shot in the arm you needed to, to, to realize uh, this, is, this is still a thing you can do here in the final week? Yeah, I think they should, our guys should be, you know, um, confident that they can play in this conference. Uh, they've shown it. Uh, if we can do it for 60 minutes straight, I, I think we'll be, we're usually in a good spot if we can do that. But uh, we, obviously we've been banged up. We've had to use a lot of different lineups. That's fine. But uh, I think for the overall, the team should feel confident going into this game that they can they can battle with these guys. And we'll see what happens. But you, you, although you're willing to battle, you still need some things to go your way. And, and the way you do it is eliminate, li- eliminate or minimize the mistakes that have been happening so uh we can do that and that 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 really comes down to turnovers uh limit turnovers and then get as many turnovers as we can on defense and special teams and i think we'll be good and looks like the elements might be maybe even help out in that that way yeah it'd be nice uh, to get some takeaways because it's been a few weeks it has and and granted other teams have noticed that we are good at taking the ball away and They've been very extra careful with, with possessing. We've seen some opportunities, some drop interceptions, and also some, uh, uh, you know, some ball uh, footballs on the ground for some fumbles, but not able to get them. And this is a good time for us to capitalize on all those opportunities. Okay, what do you think of uh, Mike Gundy's Oklahoma State Cowboys? Really good team, and obviously they're, they're uh, running back is the key on offense. But uh, I think you can't uh, discount what they can do on offensively in the pass game as well. Uh, it's just. We can't allow them to be balanced. That's just going to be a problem for us. If they are able to run the ball and establish play action and their RPOs uh, defensively, they try to they try to take away all the all the big plays from us. So offensively, we need to find a way to possess the ball, um, convert first downs. We don't have to wait till third and, and, and fourth downs, but uh, let's just get get the chains moving, and then uh, and then when we get in the in the red zone, make sure we we capitalize by putting touchdowns on the scoreboard. Uh, We'll live with the field goals if we need to, but the touchdowns and PATs will be the key. Offensively, OSU got unbalanced at UCF, and that's why things turned out the way they did that day. Yeah, and and that's that's, uh, part of the game, but I I mean, I think that was a little bit of the... uh, Maybe the the leftover from the the emotional bedlam, bedlam game, yeah. but but uh, still you have to give. You, if you look at this conference, anybody has a shot if they, as long as they uh, play a clean and and assignment sound game. Uh, we're obviously going to be a much better team if we play assignment sound, and if we focus on the fundamentals and technique, we'll be in a really good spot. I think the energy of the team is ready to go, and, and uh, I'm glad that the kickoff is at daytime. Alan Bowman focused on Brennan Presley last week against Houston. Fifteen catches for number eighty last week. Yeah, and and a really good player, and and, and uh, you know active, but very uh, elusive. Uh, their entire team has a bunch of players that can make plays with the, with the ball in their hands. We we have to just make sure that we secure tackles, and that's going to be the key. Take proper angles. Been focusing on that quite a bit. Um, you know, we're on this field turf. We don't know much about it, but we're going to get out there and see what our footing is going to be like. But more than anything, it's not about the shoes. It's about the, the, the technique and, and coming to balance and making sure that we have our right leverage when it comes to tackling. How much confidence does the resurgence of this run game give you coming into today? Yeah, they should feel good. I mean, and, and having healthy Aiden Robbins and having healthy L.J. Martin is going to be key for that. And then you mix in Miles Davis and Deion Smith. Um, you know, we, we feel like the receivers can, can – can do this our the job with fly fly sweep and all those things that we we do offensively um the key is just to, let's just get some points on the board i really don't care that the playbook is in terms of the playbook's open now so let's just throw it all at them and let's see what happens somehow we've gotten to game 12 here's hoping there's yeah. a game 13 <laughs> yeah and and um maybe not the way that we thought it would happen but but we we have uh been in a position now where we've done enough things to get to get an opportunity to to play for a bowl game. There's a lot of people that are not in this position that are already out of the bowl game. So it comes down to the last game, which is we should be proud of that. But at the same time, uh, it's time to take it now. So now that it's here, um, regardless of what the situation is for Oklahoma State, we, we want to keep this going and we want to play another game. So here we go. Kalani, thank you for the time. As always, we'll talk to you post game. Go Cougs. Thank you. That is BYU head coach Kalani Sitake, and this has been the Zions Bank Cougar Pre-Game Coaches Show. Time now for today's forward keys to the game. They're brought to you by your local Ford stores. BYU football built Ford proud. Hans Olsen, what are your keys for the Cougs here today? Well, Greg, you know me. You know I don't like to take the low-hanging fruit. I like to look for other keys, things that are really important. But in this case, i got to take the low-hanging fruit. You're going to have to bottle up Ollie Gordon. He's rushed over 100 yards in seven of the last eight games, including two 200-plus-yard performances. 
Central Florida held him to just 25 yards, and we saw the outcome on that one. That's a 45-3 to win for Central Florida. Ollie Gordon, 25 yards, equals a loss. Ollie Gordon going over 100 yards, probably going to equal a win for Oklahoma State. So what I'm thinking, if I'm Jay Hill, I'm thinking go ahead and throw it. But one thing you're not going to do is go for over 100 yards with one individual. And I am going to do everything I can to keep Ollie Gordon inside and and behind that front. So I'm going to crash gaps, and I'm going to really play hard with my safeties up front. Okay. Number two, Jake Retzloff has to make good decisions all day long. When to pitch, when to give, when to keep, when to tuck, when to throw, where to throw. It's not about his ability because I think he's got all the goods. It's about his decision-making. And they need to be clean through all four quarters. He cannot have a hiccup. So Jake Retzloff and his decision-making. And then number three, it's the spirit of the players. Who wants it? Central Florida, they came out with their offense, RPO, the length of the field, mostly zone read option, Greg. It looked very familiar. So I'd like to see BYU's offense have high tempo, high spirits. I want to see their defense flying around. You remember through most quarters of that Oklahoma game, we were watching BYU's defense in the gang tackling. They were all over the field, and they were swarming. I want to see that spirit because I think that that elevated spirit is what's going to carry this uh, one of these teams to the win today. That's Hans Olsen. Those are the keys to the game brought to you by Ford. Coming up next, the Cougar kickoff show live from Stillwater, Oklahoma, on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. We're getting closer to kickoff of BYU football. You're tuned to the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show. Ken Garf, we hear you. The Cougar Kickoff Show is also brought to you by Bailey's. We move with you every step of the way since 1952. Also brought to you by BYU Creamery, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. Now, let's head live to the All-Pro Capital broadcast booth. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Good afternoon once again, Cougar Nation. We are coming to you live from Boone Pickens Stadium in Stillwater, Oklahoma. It is cold, it is gray, it is wet. This 54,000-seat venue has been sold out for all seven home games this season, and today Oklahoma State plays for a sixth home win in a third consecutive year. More importantly for OSU, the Cowboys are playing for a spot in the Big 12 championship game next Saturday at AT AT&T Stadium in Arlington. BYU's goal is more modest any kind of postseason berth in one of the Big 12's contracted lower tier bowl games or perhaps another bowl game because there are already nine Big 12 teams that are bowl eligible. UCF just became the ninth, defeating Houston. So the only Big 12 newcomer to qualify for the postseason so far is UCF. BYU would like to join the Knights in that category later on this afternoon. But in its first season as a power conference member, any kind of postseason play would have to be considered a success for the Cougars, who come into today's game on a four-game losing streak. It's the second straight season with a four-game slide. Now, the last longer losing streak to end, uh, rather, in any season was the seven-game skid in Kalani's second year as head coach back in 2017. But to end a year, you got to go back to 1955 to find a losing streak like this. Uh, BYU that year lost its last eight games in a row. BYU today trying to avoid a five-game slide to end the year, so lots on the line. This is the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show presented by Ken Garf. Whatever your vehicle needs are, go to KenGarf.com. Ken Garf, we hear you. Greg Grubel, Hans Olsen in our All-Pro Capital broadcast booth, former BYU wide receiver Mitchell Juergens on the sidelines and in the Zions Bank end zone for 150 years of helping you succeed. Zions Bank is for you. Our scoreboard host is Ben Bagley. Booth engineers, Ben and Lily Warner. Our spotter, Jake Murphy. Coordinating producer, Terry South. Control board operators are James Finlayson and Maya Tippetts. Our studio editor is Derek Dungan. And today's stats interns are Jonathan Hall and Talmadge Hilton. You are joining us on the new skin, BYU Sports Network, our satellite flagship, BYU Radio, Sirius XM 143, our Salt Lake City over-the-air flagship, KSL News Radio, 102.7 FM and 1160 AM. We're also on the BYU Radio app, the KSL apps, as well as on BYURadio.org and our network affiliates in Utah and Idaho. You can subscribe to the BYU Football Podcast for broadcast archives and highlights. 
You can also get those on the BYU Radio app and at byuradio.org. Search sports or shows and then find BYU football. All right, as has been the case for the last four games, we begin our pregame analysis with a look at the Cougars' quarterback situation. Jake Retzlaff will start. Keaton Slovis will be available. And the question for A-Rod this week and recent weeks has been, who gives BYU the best chance to win? Is it Jake Retzloff, the young dual-threat quarterback who has brought a spark to the BYU offense but has struggled a bit with ball security, or Keaton Slovis, the fifth-year senior who's a more accomplished passer but does not give BYU the run threat and is working his way back from injury? A-Rod and Kalani have both said that if Keaton's 100%, then he could be the better call, but he's not exactly 100%. Kalani said he's not quite there, and so it is uh, Jake Retzloff getting the fourth consecutive start for BYU today. So I think that Jake Retzloff right now gives you the best chance. We talked a little bit about it. If you start seeing turnovers early, maybe you go to Keaton Slovis, but I've got some pretty brutal turnovers and blazed in my mind that Keaton Slovis put out there. That Kansas game was really difficult. You come out in the second half and make a really bad read and decision, and the ball goes the other way for a pick six. So I believe it's Jake Retzloff. I also believe that there is going to be just a little bit of heat on his back, and if it does go sideways, we might see Keaton Slovis. But I also want to point out, Jake Retzloff gave you 210 yards through the air against West Virginia. Jake Retzloff gave you 70 yards on the ground against Iowa State. Jake was pretty square and equal against Oklahoma outside of the couple of turnovers that he was responsible for. My opinion, Jake Retzloff is the answer to a win against Oklahoma State, but I wouldn't be surprised to see Keaton Slovis if things went sideways somewhere in the third or fourth quarter. Really good breakdown, and I agree with everything you just said. Let's take a look now at this week's E-Assist player to watch for BYU. It's brought to you by the E-Assist Dental Health Education Foundation, reminding you that dental cleanings are essential for your health. Hands Who's your BYU player to watch today here at Stillwater? Well, it's going to be Aiden Robbins. He went for 182 yards on 22 carries last week against a good Oklahoma front. Oklahoma State gives up 176 rushing yards per game. Greg, that is just good enough for 109th in the country. So they do give up those rushing yards. We'll see if Aiden can carry the weight of this BYU offense for a second week as they're here looking for bowl eligibility, but... I am paying very close attention to the way Aiden Robbins comes out. Don't know how much L.J. Martin will see. I know he's in the lineup. But Aiden will be the decider of how much L.J. is on the field. If he comes out and carries it strong, it's going to be him all day. And he's about 80 yards behind L.J. to be the leading rusher for this team right now. So he could go claim that leading rusher. And don't forget, BYU fans, he's got another year of eligibility. So keep your fingers crossed that you see good Aiden Robbins today against Oklahoma State. All right, we'll have more of the Ken Garf kickoff show after this brief break. But first, a reminder to go to BigOtires.com and make an appointment at one of 50 locally owned and operated Utah locations. Big O Tires, the team you trust. Pre-game coverage from Stillwater, Oklahoma continues right after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. is the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show. Let's get back to Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Coming up in about 20 minutes, BYU 5-6 and six overall, 2-6 and six in the Big 12, visiting 8-3 and three Oklahoma State. Cowboys 6-2 and two in the Big 12 and trying to lock down no worse than a second-place tie that may come with it, a spot in the Big 12 title game next weekend. Another early afternoon ABC TV window game for BYU. Uh, these haven't been the best for BYU this season. BYU's 0-3 in these 130 Mountain Time games this year, 0-4 in day games overall. The Cougs have lost their last consecutive afternoon games. 
Uh, despite losing 31-24 at, at, at home to Oklahoma last week, BYU could take comfort in the fact that, uh, well, the Cougs played one of their best games of the season. The Cougs averaged more yards per play than Oklahoma did. Field position was dead even. BYU outgained Oklahoma, held the Sooners to the second lowest total offense yardage tally they had on the year. The Cougars hit hard. The run game came alive. Season high, 217 yards on the ground behind 182 from Aiden Robinson. Hence, of all the late season developments, that's been the most encouraging. A-Rod said he simplified the run schemes. The O-line has executed those schemes more effectively, and Robbins looks like the 1,000-yard back he was last year at UNLV. It may be too a little too late, but Coach Roderick says what we saw last week, that's what the BYU offense is supposed to look like and what's supposed to look like this season. Well, when you and I were out at those early spring scrimmages and some of the early fall scrimmages, that's what we thought this BYU offense was going to look like. We thought it would have a little bit of pep. We thought it would have some movement. Now we knew that Keaton Slovis wasn't the most mobile quarterback, but I expected that offensive line to be dominant coming through fall camp and into the start of the season. And it was bizarre to see this run game stopped time and time again. Watching 66 yards of production or 80 yards of production, that's not who this team is. This team is what we saw last week. So Aaron Roderick got a good taste of it. This team got a good taste of it. Now we'll see if it remains fresh in their mind and they come out and get the good start against Oklahoma State. Time now for our Hyatt Place Comfort Zone feature during our pregame coverage at Hyatt Place Provo. Your convenience and comfort will always be our highest priority. And despite the myriad injuries suffered at the safety spot this year and Ethan Slade is the latest player to go down in that position group, he will not play today. Uh, his absence, Ethan Slade, coincides with the return of Talon Alfrey, who looked increasingly comfortable last week in only his, uh, his uh, second game of the season after missing the first nine with an upper body injury. Last week against OU, Talon Alfrey led BYU in tackles and solo tackles and reminded us just how much BYU missed him and his would-be safety teammate, Micah Harper, who was lost for the season in training camp. It's been a tough year for the safeties. It has, and this game is critical for safety play. In fact, Crew Wakely and Talon Alfrey should be your leading two tacklers at the conclusion of this game. They should be, and I'll tell you why. You're going to play seven in the box, and you're going to continue to try to stuff the Oklahoma State run by Ollie Gordon. What that means is you put linemen in gaps, not penetrative, but you put linemen in gaps, each gap is responsible. That makes Ollie Robinson bounce, or sorry, Ollie Gordon bounce and bounce, and you should have the safety there as an outlet to make the tackle. Also, I expect Oklahoma State to have an intermediate passing game, and because you're bringing your linebackers up to plug gaps, safeties might have to be the first outlet to tackle the, that intermediate route game. So... You're going to plug, and those safeties have to come up, and they got to play physical. Andrew Rich style. Mm. One of my favorite all-time BYU safeties. Andrew Rich style tonight from these BYU safeties. All right, we're back with more of the Ken Garf Cougar kickoff show live from Boone Pickens Stadium in Stillwater, Oklahoma, right after this break on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Listening to the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, let's head live to the All Pro Capital broadcast booth. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Getting you set for BYU and Oklahoma State on this chilly Saturday afternoon in Stillwater. 45 degrees and drizzle right now. We talked in our last segment about a positive late season development with the emergence of the BYU run game. A less encouraging development has emerged in the turnover margin. Earlier in the year, it was a strength for this BYU team. Even when some other stats were suboptimal, BYU's penchant for takeaways and care with the football helped the Cougars to that 5-2 and two start. Through those seven games... BYU is plus nine in the turnover margin. During the current four-game losing streak, BYU's minus eight. Well, that's a turnaround. And the Cougars don't have a single takeaway over the last three games. Hand simply put, BYU lost its chance at a season-altering upset last week against Oklahoma. That was a game that would have clinched a bowl berth. And, and it was the minus three in the margin that doomed the Cougs against the Sooners. A pick six completely changed the game, and, and fumbles lost both before and after that play led directly to Oklahoma touchdowns. You could boil it down to the reason BYU's not bowl eligible here this afternoon already. Yeah, it, I think that's very true. 
And I look at Oklahoma State and their issues because they're not without their own issues. They've lost 15 turnovers so far this season. Some of those coming through way of pick. In fact, you're looking at nine interceptions thrown right now by Bowman. And some coming by way of fumble, even from Ollie. In fact, in the last three games, he's got two turned over. So I'll go back to the Central Florida game. Ollie Gordon, his first carry, it was a fumble. Went back to Central Florida. That created the momentum for Central Florida to go get the win. Against Houston, Bowman came out and he threw a pick six. So they will turn the ball over. you got to look for those moments. you got to force those moments and make sure you come out of this in the positive side. Coming up, we'll head down to field level and check in with the third on-air member of our crew here in Stillwater, Mitchell Jurgens, as the Ken Garp Cougar kickoff show continues. After this, from Boone Pickens Stadium on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show. Let's get back to Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. BYU and Oklahoma State straight ahead here in Stillwater. Sixth time this season that BYU will face a running back who's currently in the top 40 in rush yards per game. But OSU's Ollie Gordon is not simply top 40. He is number one. He's run for 100-plus yards in seven of his last eight games. He had back-to-back games with 250-plus rush yards earlier in the year and three consecutive games with 250-plus from scrimmage. But as we bring in former BYU wide receiver Mitchell Jurgens in the Zions Bank end zone, for 150 years of helping you succeed, Zions Bank is for you. We note, Mitch, that each of the previous five top 40 backs, well, they were held below their season average by BYU. And Mitch, if BYU can keep Ollie under his number today, that's half the battle against the Cowboys. Yeah, Greg, selfishly, I'm, I'm really excited to watch Ollie Gordon today at field level. This is a really special player who could have a great and long future in the NFL, but how much more exciting would it be for BYU to just to do what uh, just what they've done against some of the best backs in the country this year and put some serious limitations on Gordon's game? Uh, as you mentioned, it'll be a tough battle, but if they want a shot at this game, you have to force this Oklahoma State team into a pass-heavy attack by holding the Cowboys offense and specifically Ollie Gordon to zero or minimal gains on the ground on first and second down. So in my opinion, that will be the key to get in the edge in this game, but that doesn't mean that the game will be BYU's. There are plenty of other players outside of Ollie Gordon and up to 60,000 fans here today that want that Big 12 championship game. So backed by Juice Crowd, there will be other players who will step up. So BYU, they need to bring the energy, the physicality, and the fight from start to finish to pull off the upset. Excellent stuff, Mitch. Thank you. Coming up next, we'll have the coin toss, the opening kick. This has been the Ken Garf Cougar kickoff show live from Boone Pickens Stadium in Stillwater, Oklahoma, on the new skin, BYU Sports Network.